taken bold measures aiming at ensuring that all Tanzanians benefit from the, the country's natural resource endowment. And some of the recent actions include provision of free basic education, a frontal attack on corruption, rural electrification, setting aside 10% of local government budgets to support projects run by women, youth, and people with disability. We have also gone the way of renegotiating mining contracts for win-win to both the government and investors, ensuring that processing of minerals takes place within the country, pushing for more job opportunities for Tanzanians in the mining industry and construction. And we have also built a wall around a Tanzanite mine at Mererani to curb smuggling of Tanzanite. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, by this time it should be very clear why the fifth phase government is keenly interested in this conference. We see it as a unique opportunity for active interaction between domestic researchers and policymakers uh, with international policy practitioners and friends of Tanzania with the objective of sharing insights challenges, and policy choices at hand to promote further inclusive, inclusive growth and development in resource-rich Tanzania, of course informed by the Stockholm Statement. Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, I do not want to spend a lot of time because that will steal your appetite uh, for the incoming discussions. Before I conclude my remarks, I would like to, once again to thank the Economic and Social Research Foundation and the Embassy of Sweden for organizing such a great conference. I wish also to reiterate the excitement of the government of Tanzania regarding this conference and the intellectual and policy contributions it brings. We in the government are very keen to continue with our collaboration and partnership with academic and research institutions like ESRF, as well as all friends of Tanzania in pursuit of inclusive growth and development of our country. After these remarks, it is now my singular honor to declare on behalf of Honorable Kasim M. Majaliwa, Member of Parliament, the Prime Minister of the United Republic of Tanzania, that the seventh ESRF annual conference is officially opened. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Honorable Mpango, MP and Minister for Finance and Planning. Uh, and thank you for not killing our appetite. You just wet it. So as we go to the next stage of the discussion, uh, I'll tell the story later on, not now, but we're trying to catch up on time. Uh, so if I can ask the high table to move to the table there, except for the panelists and Professor Mkenda, who's going to be the moderator for this coming session. So if I can have the three of you, uh, the four of you. So if I can have you.
Hello, 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 hello. Um, I'll leave this here. I'll turn this down. Put this over here. Turn this down. Turn this down. Turn this down. There's a cow shake okay, here. And if I can now hand over officially. So we're going to have this uh, discussion going on now and presentations. There will be two presentations to start off with and then we'll have a tea break and then we'll continue with to listen to our Nobel laureate and then after that we'll discuss how are we going to have our lunch. Thank you. I, I hand over to you now. Thank you very much, um, George. Um, I have a very noble but rather is a task of just moderating presentation by the great minds that we have here today. Uh, and we'll start with Professor Kaushik Basu. If I was to read his profile, it will take the whole day. Just to summarize, Professor Basu is a professor of economics and C. Max Professor of International Studies at the International Professor of International Studies at the Cornell University and former Senior Vice President and Chief Economist of the World Bank. He has published widely, uh, including a books on game theory, welfare economics, and one of his former uh, books is Analytical Eco Development Economics, 1997. So Professor Basu will present on inclusive Development and Global Policy Coordination. Professor Basu. Should I go up there or? I think you, whichever is easier for you if you are. That's fine. Why don't I stay here and use this uh, instead then? Honorable uh, Minister of uh, Finance, Mr. Mapango, Her Excellency um, Ambassador of uh, Sweden, Katrina Rangnit, Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Adolf Makande, Chairman ESRF, Mr. Lohanjo, Executive Director, ESRF, Tausi Kida, uh, my um, uh, fellow economist, Joe Stiglitz, and uh, um, Sabina Alkaire, distinguished members of the audience. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to be here. I should just begin by thanking the Swedish Embassy and ESRF for organizing this event. This is potentially an extremely important event and also very special thanks to the two persons with whom I've been interacting before the conference, Trua Shedvin and Tausi Kida. Thank you very much for organizing this. We live in very strange times. Uh, there is a vacuum of leadership in the world today of a kind rarely seen. Some of that role is being relinquished by the United States European Union remains too troubled by putting its economic house in order. China is not quite there yet. It's a prominent power, so there is a vacuum at the top. And that places a very special responsibility on the Commit Committee of Nations on developing countries, a country like Tanzania, to organize, collect thoughts, put the best ideas in place together. I will need to move the PowerPoint, so yeah. if I can move it. Should I go to the podium? I'll do that. Okay. Yes, very good. Okay, excellent. There is a case for emerging economies to take the best ideas from around the world, put together conventions, drawing on the best research for collaboration to take the world economy further forward, to bring their ideas to the table. And this has indeed a long history. 
including a history out of this region and this country. We know that for the non-aligned movement, Tanzania played quite a prominent role and not quite there at the Bandung conference, but later on, it put out some very, very prominent statements about the idea of inclusive development, the idea of human development. You would see statements of that coming out from your country over here, and a lot of that gets stated in the Arusha Declaration in 1967. And some of those principles find a resonance in the Stockholm Statement, which tries to broaden the notion of what constitutes the main pillars of modern economic development, to broaden the agenda of economics, to talk in terms of equity and distribution. GDP is important, but not the only important thing. Gender distribution, equity across genders is important. Income distribution in itself is important. And far-sightedness and sustainability. And once again, when I was going back in preparation for this and looking at some of the early literature, I saw that in 1967, at the time of the Arusha Declaration, Julius Nyerere making the statement, and I'm quoting him, our natural resources are owned by all citizens and held in trust for their descendants. This is a very far-sighted observation being made in 1967. Sustainability, which is our major concern now, gets stressed as early as that. And that is really, it is, that this is an occasion for us to try to revive some of those older ideas. What I'm going to talk about today is something that the finance minister mentioned, inclusive development, the importance of inclusive development, and something which is a slightly technical problem, I thought as an economist I should bring to the table, coordination of policies across nations, across different entities. We have already mentioned, and the Stockholm Statement gives a lot of importance to that, that the market, state, and community are important players, but they cannot act independently. It is a coordinating role among the three institutions that is extremely important. So a lot of the talk is going to be on coordination of policies and how do we do it, how do we do it. For a better world, I should point out that collaboration and Coordination can be done for all kinds of reasons. A group of firms colluding is also co cooperating among themselves, but for the wrong reasons. My topic is what economics should be concerned about, coordination for the betterment of human lives. You know, when my mother was 90 years old, she was beginning to confuse about exactly what my profession was. But only thing she was sure is that it's something to make the world a better place. She was in particular tripping up between the word economist and communist. <laughs> so once when I visited her in Calcutta, she was 90 years old, and I told her that I'm going to London for a conference. And the way you exaggerate a little bit for your parents to feel happy, I said it's a very important conference, and leading economists from all over the world are coming to discuss welfare economics. The next day, I heard my mother telling a whole bunch of younger relatives, that I'm so happy Koushik is going to London, where leading communists from all over the world <laughs> are coming to discuss how to make the world a better place. <laughs> so the better place was stuck in her head, but the profession, she was getting a bit confused. And it's in that spirit that I'm going to discuss today the idea of coordination of policies. It's the crux of taking the world further forward. We still live in a world which is, it's a strange world because at one level it's extremely prosperous, it's extremely well off, but at another level the masses of poverty in the world is also enormous. You know, when at the World Bank we were working with the poverty line of $1.90 per person per day, so $1.90 of consumption per person, a lot of civil society activists, friends of mine, would come very upset. Say, how do you draw a line so low? Isn't it 
unfair, undignified to draw a poverty line as low as that. To which my response was, yes, it's a very low poverty line, but roughly one seventh of the world lives below that shockingly low poverty line. Most of us would not know people who live below that poverty line, yet about one seventh of the world lives below that poverty line. Here are some numbers for as reminders. I'm going to get myself a bottle. This is all using the World Bank poverty line, $1.90. And you can see um, the levels and the distribution of um, poverty in the world. It's going down everywhere. Uh, we were very concerned about Sub-Saharan Africa because in particular from about 1985 to 1995, things were going very poorly. But after that, things are improving. But still, Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo, 77%. Ethiopia, 55% to 33%. What you can see, interestingly, is in Tanzania, let me jump to that, it's 49%, 48% perhaps now, but it's crossed over Nigeria. It's gone below Nigeria, the total amount of poverty. This is with the World Bank line. I know that with your national line, you'll get a different figure. But you also get hopes from countries like China, where poverty used to be shockingly high, 88% of the population was below the poverty line. Over a couple of decades, it's now down to around 10%, 11.2% in 2012. This is slightly dated figure uh, numbers for which I had sure numbers. After that, its projections are involved. Now, it is really shameful in many ways that we live in such an unequal world where there is so much prosperity and yet so much poverty. You know, one very simple number that are to remind you how unequal the world is. Three individuals and three countries, the three wealthiest individuals in the world have more wealth than all the people of Angola, Burkina Faso, Democratic Republic of Congo. 100 and, close to 130 million people have less wealth than three of the wealthiest individuals in the world. Now, as an economist, I'm aware that a certain amount of inequality you do need. That gives you incentive to work, to do better, but not the level of inequality we have today. And I really believe that there will come a time when looking back at today, we will be shocked that human beings tolerated this level of inequality as we do today. So we need, yes, there will be inequality, you need that as a driver, but not of the level that we have in today's world. How do, how do you go about this? It is true that for many of these problems today, unlike in the old world, a single country acting is not enough. Each country has its responsibility. You want to do as well as possible. You want to distribute well-being. But the world is becoming a common pool, a common market. And it's very difficult for individual countries to take all the steps. International organizations, transnational bodies, and rich countries with an interest in global well-being have all got to come together to coordinate and work on the best policies. I want to give you a sense of how difficult it is to coordination problem and market failure. This is a bit of a classroom, one slide I will give you, which is a one picture to understand how markets can fail and how inter-country policies can make a difference in today's world. And this picture explains to you the essence of the European sovereign debt crisis that happened. And I'm going to, there is the picture. This is one of the most striking pictures that you can see. You seldom see such clear patterns. Let me just explain in words. It's a classroom example of market failure. The pic picture starts a bit before 1999. And the countries that you have, I don't know how clearly you can see it over there. But it's the borrowing cost of different countries. So right in the beginning, at the top, the graph is Greece. Greek government has to pay a very high interest rate for people to lend money to Greece. They are nervous. At the bottom are Germany and France. They don't have to pay a high interest rate. 
people will feel confident and they lend to Germany and France at a much lower interest rate. So there's a spread of interest rates. Around 1999, they almost all the interest rates come together. Every country borrowing in the Eurozone are borrowing roughly at the same interest rate. Why is that? Well, the Euro as a currency has been formed. So the market players began to believe that with the monetary union, whether you lend to Greece or whether you lend to Germany, it's all happening in euros. It's the same risk that you're facing and the interest rates became, became the same. In fact, Greece joins up that curve not in 1999, but in 2001 when Greece joins the euro. Greek, uh, Greece as a country joins the euro two years later. All of them paying the same interest rate. Up to 2008, you're lending to these countries, treating them as the same risk. It's all deals in euros being struck and all these countries are borrowing money. There was a massive market failure taking place over this period, which would damage the global economy for a very long time. In 2008, after the subprime crisis in the United States, and after the global financial markets got into a turmoil, gradually the realization dawned that the European Union, the Eurozone is a monetary union, it's not a fiscal union. If you lend money to Greece, it's Greece's responsibility to pay you back. It's not the ECB's responsibility. When you lend money to Germany, it's Germany's responsibility. And now, unlike before 1999, there is an additional problem. Before 1999, if Greece had a difficulty in paying you back, Greece could print some currency and pay you back. They, Greece can't do that anymore. So from 2008, suddenly the interest rates pan out again. Greece finds that it's very difficult for the Greeks to borrow money because they have to pay very high interest rate to persuade people that it's safe to lend to them. But for over a roughly an eight, nine year period, the interest rate, global interest rates were malfunctioning the market and the damage done was huge. The European countries had come out of this period with debts which were so large. I remember since I used to do policy in India those days, Throughout, historically, it would be the Europeans telling India that, look, keep your debt to GDP ratio low. But by the time I became chief economic, uh, ec economic advisor to the Indian government, the European debts were much higher than Indian debt to GDP ratio because during this period of a malfunctioning of the market, things had gone awry. There are many other problems that developed countries face today. I think the negative and zero, very low interest rate problem is again a trap. The original plan was that you lower interest rates. People will not save money, put money in banks. They will spend more. So that will give a boost to consumption. But when interest rate goes so low, after some time people begin to worry that money I'm putting away for my retirement is not earning enough. So you actually begin to save more, though the savings earn very little, you have no choice. You begin to save more. So the market by then is malfunctioning. But when six or seven countries have very low interest rates, you are scared to alone move out of this trap because as soon as you raise your interest rate, money will come rushing to your country, your currency will appreciate and you will not be able to export. So you get into again a coordination problem and a trap that I feel right now the rich countries will have to sort out. But I want to take the little bit of time that I have actually to talk much more about emerging economies and the challenge that they face. The big challenge which uh, um, Professor Stiglitz um, uh, had already mentioned is coming with technology and the labor market. The labor space of the labor market is changing dramatically. And there are two particular innovations have always taken place from the Stone Age. But in today's world, there are two different kinds of technology, technological change taking place, which is changing the landscape of labor. There is labor saving technology, which always happens. Robots, artificial intelligence is changing the marketplace. But in addition, and this gives a window to economies like Tanzania, emerging economies around the world, is 
labor linking technology. Increasingly, it is possible for you to sit in Dar es Salaam and work for consumers in Tokyo and for a company which may be in New York. Through labor linking technology, you can do that. And that is changing the landscape of the labor market. And the labor saving technology is decreasing the share of GDP that goes to workers. And on this, I will let me skip over all this. I don't want to. I, this is the last picture that I'm showing. So here is some data on the share of GDP that goes to workers. In rich countries, this is a very sharp and clear trend. The share going to workers is going down. No surprises. There is artificial intelligence, robotic creatures coming into the workplace, and labor linking technology means that people far away can join your, the labor market and begin to do work. And if you look at the share of GDP, in Australia it's down from 1975, it was 66%, 67% of the GDP, now it is 54%, every country you take. Japan, it's a very sharp fall, from 77% to 60% roughly, and virtually any country you take, rich country and upper middle income country, the share being earned by workers is going down. This is a trend that we have to live with, but we have to remind ourselves that when major technological changes take place, it's also time to do major rethinking in terms of policies. People very often tell me that the industrial revolution transformed the workplace, but the world has come out fine out of that. What they forget is that during the industrial revolution, there was also a churn of thinking about how you organize the labor market, which played a very important role. You know, I, that's a period that I take a lot of interest in because of my interest in child labor. And there are these British parliamentary documents, which is extremely touching, where they interview children who work for 12 hours, 14 hours a day. And there are these interviews with them where they talk about how by the day's end, occasionally they fall down because they are just so exhausted by the level of work. And there are also repeated statements you will find being made by people saying that, well, you know, people have to work 12 hours, 14 hours a day because that builds character. Of course, you'll never build your own children's character that way, but other people's children's character is being, being built through hard work. But I don't want to say that these people are wicked people saying that. That was the thought those days, that the working classes working 12 hours a day builds character and they'll be better workers. All that changed with a series of very, very revolutionary thinking that now seems commonplace to us. First law coming in that 10 hour a day, no one should work more than 10 hours a day. The 10 hour a day movement today would seem completely natural, but that time it needed a lot of radical thinking. Robert Peel's Factories Act, 1802, lot of radical changes being made into regulation of the uh, labor market. And today the sort of things that we take for granted took place because people were willing to stick their necks out, do some very radical thinking and bring in new laws and regulations. And this is a time today in the world to do the same. For emerging economies in the middle of this, I believe personally that there is a 10, 15 year window that despite these technological changes, if you can make use of the labor linking technology, your manufacturing sector, services sector in particular, will have a 10, 15 year window when you can continue to do well, for which you do need a couple of very, very important things. Internet connectivity in today's world is important and wherever I go to developing countries, I stress that internet connectivity is not a luxury. You have to allow for better connectivity so that your workers can link up. You need basic infrastructure. You need electricity, you need water supply, so where the people sit and work, they get have access to those things. And you need law and order. And law and order, for instance, your country has a reasonable amount of law and order. You have that advantage. You have infrastructure, you have to work and provide better infrastructure. Provide these things and a window is going to open up for some time whereby these countries can do better. But 
In the long run, we need to do what was done in the 18th century and 19th century, a lot of radical thinking in terms of new regulations so that emerging economies can work with rich countries together to create a better world. And unless we can attend to the problem of extreme inequality of wealth, I feel political conflict, rather than anything else, will be like climate change. Today we are aware and we are getting together to address the problem of climate. Extreme wealth inequality is a challenge of that kind. And a lot of this, since the emerging economies, the developing countries, I come from one, I come from India, they are the ones who are taking the brunt of this. They need to get together once again in the spirit of what was once done, the Arusha Declaration talking in terms of pan-African ideas. And in the Stockholm Statement, we repeatedly point out, it is an eight-item um, uh, statement, the human development, equity, these are important ideas. And if we can take some of those initiatives out of an emerging economy, a developing country like Tanzania, where in your Arusha declaration you were talking of pan-African ideas, but all emerging economies in a similar state have a lot of common interest. If through statements, through ideas being put into the public space, that can be given prominence, that will be a first step towards a better world. And we've done this before, we've done this during the Industrial Revolution and come out on top of things. We can do that once again and we need to do that. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I think we needed more time for, for the lecture, Prof. Sabasu. Thank you very much for, for your presentation. Um, if I may paraphrase, it is really a shame that we live in a world of such abundance, but the majority are wallowing in abject poverty. And he pointed out the importance of global coordination because it's impossible given the global interconnectedness across countries for one country to resolve the major problems that are facing us today and the challenge that is ahead of us. Uh, the growing inequality that is going hands in hands with technological revolution. You did mention, cited some of the major landmark like Bandung Conference Arusha Declaration, Washington Consensus, Stockholm Statement. Now, clearly, at any point in time, we need a system of values that will inspire our action. I think Stockholm Statement provides such a platform. Because after all, we are talking about fighting poverty. And you mentioned Arusha Declaration, but if you go by Mwalim Nyerere's way of looking at welfare, you cannot just assess human welfare in terms of income alone. And in his essay, Freedom and Development, he wrote something that was even better paraphrased by Amata Sen in Development as Freedom, that development is a process of removing various kinds of unfreedom against poverty, against tyranny, against all sorts of things. And that brings the challenge on how to measure welfare and well-being, to which I think Professor Salbina Alkaya has excelled in terms of bringing various dimensions of well-being into one index that will help us to summarize properly the kind of development that we need. Professor Sabina Alkaya is famous for that. Uh, again, if I was to read her, her profile, it will overtake her lecture today, and I think we are all eager to listen to her presentation. She is a professor at Oxford University, and I think the founder of uh, Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, and one of the first output I think I remember uh, was the work you did using Tanzanian Household Budget Survey data combining various dimensions of poverty. So we are all eager to listen to your uh, discussion. Professor Sabina, welcome.
Your Excellency, uh, Minister Philippe Mbango, um, gracious Ambassador, Catherine Rangnit, um, Honorable Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, distinguished panelists, Professor Stiglitz and Basu, um, Dr. Tao Sakida, uh, Executive Director of ESRF, and uh, Philomen Nuhunja, uh, the Chair of the Board of Trustees. Uh, distinguished guests from the Diplomatic Corps, from the government, uh, from civil society, from academia, uh, from the media. It's a real honor to be here and to really learn from your progress and learn where you are going in the, in the different trajectory. The title is uh, Using Multidimensional Measures to Accelerate Sustainable Poverty Reduction. But in a sense, as both Koshik and the moderator have said, uh, you cannot treat these themes without fir lear first learning from the example of Tanzania. You can't read or do your doctorate on Amartya Sen's work in Development as Freedom, as I did, without reading the 1968 Freedom and Development that you just mentioned. Um, you can't uh, work on multidimensional poverty with a focus on empowerment and agency, which is central to any work on poverty without learning from self-reliance. You can't be secretary of a South-South network, as we are at OFI with representation from Tanzania from Dr. Albina Chua without learning from that leadership of Tanzania, nor do a Stockholm statement without learning from Arusha declaration. So it's really uh, an ongoing two-way dialogue, I believe, that we have here. And I look fa forward very much to the next phase. Um, but what I will focus on is measurement, measurement of poverty, but really building on what Koshek said in a very large overarching sense, looking at policy coordination. Um, and so looking at the link between a number that can ignite consciences or mobilize the reluctant, um, uh, generate debate, or even lay to rest a pressing problem, as Miguel Tsekeli put it in his book, Numbers That Move the World, looking at how a number has, in many national contexts, come to ignite exactly that action. And I draw on the country examples of many members of our network. So I'm speaking not in a sense on our own behalf, but on half of many countries that are already using national multidimensional poverty measures. And I do so aware that in the 2016 National Development Framework here, there is an interest in also taking this route um, and exploring how it could, as the minister said, help the wonderful achievements of Tanzania no longer coincide with poverty. Um, I then will focus on the third principle of the Stockholm Statement, which is uh, inclusive development, um, socially and economically, and perhaps also environmentally, so as not to leave behind any groups of the population, however defined. And recognizing that, in a sense, to get to that end point of inclusive development, it requires a shift in methods, um, in methodologies of measurement and of analysis. And I think that that is the motivation of the Stockholm Statement, uh, which we've been hearing about. And I also wanted to recognize, in a sense, the leadership of Finn Tarp, who is also among us today, as being somebody who took the statement from a form of words to try to push it much more towards being a beacon for action among the economic community. And I hope very much that this event and perhaps action in, in Dar es Salaam will take it that step further. But I also want to recognize the leadership of other panel members on measurement, and it makes me a little bit humble to talk here. Uh, Joe Stiglitz uh, co-chaired the Stiglitz and Fetusi Commission to look at measures of well-being much, much broader than poverty. And he pointed out that we are almost blind if the metrics which action is based are ill-designed or not well understood. And so he framed the need for better metrics, including metrics of overlapping deprivations, but also uh, of different aspects of quality of life or environment or GDP. And similarly, Koshik Basu um, set up the Atkinson Commission on Measuring Global Poverty, which had a focus on a $1.90 a day measure on a dashboard of non-monetary measures. Um, and that commission recognized that the SDG objectives in language and spirit recognize that poverty is multidimensional, but there's less agreement um, about how the de deprivation should be measured and whether they should be aggregated. And so in a sense, both of the colleagues have, have had leading voices in this area as well. 
Um, and that Atkinson Commission report in, indeed did recommend multidimensional measures be used and World Bank's statement by the chief economist in response indicated an interest and an intention to move in that direction. So what I will do briefly is explore what is a multidimensional poverty measure um, just in terms of the idea behind it because how it will actually be uh, implemented in Tanzania, we do not know. It depends on what are the salient aspects of poverty here, what are the salient data, data sources. And then, much more importantly, go on to how it can be used to inspire policy. Um, so, uh, what uh, the key idea which was in the stiglitz Fatusi Commission report is that when de deprivations cluster, when a person wakes up and their roof is leaking, and their child is crying and perhaps um, has some health issues, um, when they have an uncertainty in their own employment status, the clustering of disadvantages makes poverty that much worse. And so we need to look at overlapping or the joint distribution of deprivations. And so multidimensional poverty measure selects some group of indicators that are relevant for poverty in a particular country. And it looks at each particular person using the same survey and how they experience those deprivations together. So which of 10 or 15, um, the most any government has is 20 indicators, which of these do a person experience um, in the past year or since the past survey? And they do that then to create a deprivation score of, in a sense, the percentage of possible deprivations that that person is experiencing. To identify them as poor if they experience a certain number of them using a poverty cutoff like the poverty line in monetary space. And then to create an overall poverty measure that itself can be pulled apart um, to look again at the composition of poverty. So whereas a monetary poverty measure is measuring consumption or income, a multidimensional poverty is giving an overview, a headline statistic, but then it also uh, breaks back down into the indicators that construe it. Um, so just to give an example, this would be a person. These are her deprivations. Um, and you can think of her deprivation score, Miriam, and figure out if she is poor and how she's poor. And the measure for those of you who are economists are a straightforward extension of a foster Greer thorbeck um, poverty gap measure, um, which adjusts the headcount ratio, or percentage of people who are poor, by the average depth or severity of their poverty, but now in multidimensional space. So, in a sense, the benefits of a foster Greer thorbeck measure is it can be disaggregated subnationally to show who is, uh, who is poor by group of age or by occupation, by geographic region, uh, or other features. And you can then also, as I mentioned, pull it apart, which is relevant for those of you in policy to say, how much should I allocate here, or what is the configuration of deprivations here if you are in planning? So the MPI is used as a tool of planning of integrated social policies. And this is academic work and I won't bore you with it. Um, it clearly, as the ambassador said, um, the Sustainable Development Goals have put multidimensionality of well-being on the agenda, but also of poverty, recognizing poverty has many forms and dimensions. And primary among these is an extreme income poverty. Um, that remains a very important part of poverty. But perhaps it is not the only part. And perhaps now we need to complement monetary poverty measures with deprivations in other dimensions. And so what an MPI also does in the new SDG framework is it will look at a set of sustainable development goals. This is as an example from the global MPI. And in a sense, draw together one into one indicator a set of key or priority SDGs. So the government of Mexico describes its MPI as its priority setting technique for the poverty related SDGs. And it has a lot of them. <laughs> so these are slides from government of Mexico. And um, so why is perhaps this measurement approach interesting? Four quick reasons. One is that it shows how different dimensions are coordinated, and the minister mentioned the need for cost-efficient uh, social services. And the MDGs showed that sometimes cost effect actually need some information, which the, this is one source of information for that. Another is that in terms of identifying the abject poor, as the moderator said, 
um, we need to know who's deprived in several at once. And no other of the 232 sustainable development goals looks across to see who's deprived in several at once. And the third is, in a sense, the policy reasons that I will show with examples. And the fourth is a slide, again, from Mexico about efficiency, that also, because these are inter interconnected, if you hit the right group and understand with analysis the best policy sequences, again, you can have a disproportional effect or hopefully hit a strike. So primarily what I wanted to do was share examples of how governments are actually using these to accelerate uh, their progress. And so in, a, in terms of the Stockholm Statement, both to address the deprivations at the bottom of the distribution, but there are some regions like the Arab states that are also using this structure to look at the middle income or lower middle income and do strategies for different sectors of the population. Um, so what a number of governments have is an official national monetary poverty statistic and sitting alongside an official national multidimensional poverty statistic. Usually they are different. Mexico is the only government that has combined them. And just to clarify, national statistics, whether in monetary or multidimensional space, cannot be compared. Um, the dollar ninety a day measure or a global multidimensional poverty measure can be compared. And both of them are useful for very different reasons. And I'll so show a few examples of the global MPI, but mainly um, I'm focusing on national MPIs, which reflect the national data and statistical systems of their own countries. The only thing that these national MPIs cannot show is how one country relates to its neighbor. So in a global MPI, we might have data for Tanzania subnationally, but also data for DRC or Uganda, Kenya, Malawi, Mozambique, Zambia, Rwanda, Burundi. And so we can see how Tanzania sits in that framework of neighbors and perhaps learn lessons across borders. Um, but the national MPIs cannot be compared, but they can drill down more deeply within their countries. And there are many of them. Um, as I mentioned, there's a network with over 50 countries. But just between September 2015 and December of last year, um, these are the countries that launched official measures, plus Vietnam, which didn't fit on the slide. Um, but each of them are different. So in El Salvador, there was a participatory exercise, and the MPI reflects the voices of the protagonists of poverty, men and women in the villages who articulated their situation and changed the measure that the government had wanted to do, including adding environment, local lived environment, as part of their MPI. Um, in Costa Rica um, and in, in many countries, um, Colombia among them, it was aligned with the National Development Plan. So Colombia's National Development Plan had five chapters. Its MPI has five dimensions. Each of its 15 indicators reflected a goal of the National Development Plan, so there was a close linkage. Um, in uh, some countries, like the Dominican Republic, more ambitious goals like the Digital Divide come in. Um, and Mexico's measure is the only to be gendered, to be at the individual level. So how are these measures, after they are launched, making any difference, because again, the, the focus on measure for all of us is not to measure, but to reduce poverty or advance well-being. And so that link of coordinating between a metric and policy is the very important space. So these are some of the uses that are in action right now. First of all, simply as I mentioned, to complement a monetary statistic. Usually they are released on the same day. So when Chile first released its national MPI, Chile is the only high-income country at this point to have one, um, it, it, the newspapers took it in their stride, and they were quite interested at what value added there was. And in Chile, their income poverty was 14.4%, and they wanted a higher MPI so they could show the government cared more about them. So Michelle Bachelet had that as part of her ambition. And she said that, well, only 5.5 people are both experiencing monetary poverty and multidimensional poverty. So it's bringing into the view of government and policy a group of excluded citizens that um, we, we want really to focus on and drive down their deprivations. Obviously, uh, um, MPI is used to monitor poverty over time in level and in composition nationally 
and subnationally. Um, some governments like Colombia set targets. President Santos, when he launched the measure in 2011, set a target uh, for reducing MPI uh, to 22.4% uh, by 2014. And they made that target more than that, and it's now at 17%. They've launched their updated numbers. The MPIs are also always used for budget allocation. Um, for example, when the president of Costa Rica, which like Tanzania has an interesting series of social policies in their history, he wanted to reduce duplication in social programming. But he also found that in some important areas or indicators, there was no expenditure at all. So a law was passed that looked at the, the need to align expenditure with budget allocation with the level of poverty, among other things. In Bhutan, similarly, the budget allocation formula to district includes the levels of MPI. And this leads with this, within the same fiscal envelope, perhaps to uh, more effective and uh, re uh, speedy poverty reduction. Um, also, there is a targeting use, and we had the joy yesterday to visit TASAF and see how that was targeted. Some governments, Costa Rica, Colombia, many in Latin America, use the MPI now for targeting because it has lower type 1, type 2 exclusion errors. But also, there's an interesting example in China, which uh, identified in 2014 70 million poor people and have gotten that down b below 40 million by now and are going for zero by 2020. So they have a multidimensional targeting framework. The coordination that Goshik mentioned, I think, has been one of the most interesting and popular uses of an MPI. Because if you are in the ministries of health or education or statistics, and you go to a meeting, you might be competing with your fellow ministers. But if there's a headline statistics from the Ministry of Finance or Planning, um, it gives you a shared goal. So like a football team, you can work together. And the President Santos, for example, President Peña Nieto of Mexico, others have set up roundtables with the ministries to say, how can we meet our common goal of ending multidimensional poverty by coordinating? So with a simple dashboard in the case of Colombia, uh, President Santos met twice a year um, to accelerate poverty. And the ministers sort of also use this as an opportunity to learn about inter uh, interlinkages. The Minister of Health in Colombia learned that what other ministers do actually helps him to reach his health targets. And the MPI was able to make their changes visible. How? They update their MPI every year. They have alerts of the indicators that have not changed. And then they have responsive policies. So annually, you can see how they are adjusting their expenditures for an acceleration. The 2017 um, focus was on the peace deal after the peace process in Colombia, and the MPI were part of the peace negotiations there and are being d documented now. And so President Santos really saw part of their uh, advancement towards peace having to do with MPI reduction, because in the FARC-affected areas, or the IDBs, the internally displaced persons, while nationally poverty was at 22%, they were at over 80%, so they needed to really focus on poverty reduction for the peace. And finally, clearly, when you disaggregate subnationally, you can identify pockets of poverty, horizontal inequalities that, as Koshik said, can help to sustain and the peace and prevent other difficulties. Both in all over Latin America, they've disaggregated by indigenous status. So for example, in Panama, not a poor country, 91% um, uh, of people in some of their indigenous comarcas are poor, but in the capital city, um, it's 8.5%. So these are um, just a few of the different uh, decompositions and ways that governments have been trying to use this framework um, to diagnose their, uh, their ability and their policy space to be more effective. I old, would only want to mention that the private sector are also a very important partner uh, in many of the Latin American countries where they are also using the national MPI within their employee or their value chain to identify interventions that they can have towards the national goal of reducing multidimensional poverty. So just in a couple minutes um, to conclude, I wanted to show some of the information that a national MPI would provide. 
I'm using the global MPI, not saying that's the right measure, but just to illustrate the statistics. Obviously, it will provide subnational maps. Um, and for example, two regions, Lake and Central, which have 40% of the population, um, might have slightly different configurations of poverty. It will show indicator by indicator how poverty is constructed. What are the biggest deprivations? So you know, in a sense, uh, what indicators might need to be addressed first. And this can be then looked at subnationally. So I mentioned Lake and Central. They're quite different in the global MPI, years of schooling among adults um, is much higher in the Lake region, but child mortality is too. And assets, so economic benefits of growth, are stronger in Lake than in Central. And so we can see that across different provinces. So um, in conclusion, I want to say that we look forward very much to an ongoing dialogue about the entire Stockholm Statement, not just about one part of it on inclusive growth, but I think given the very inspiring history, and as a student of development economics at Oxford, I, it was Tanzania was one of the cases that we studied a great deal in our master's program. Um, it, it will be fascinating to see how you take this work forward and what a DAR statement could have in terms of implications, not only here, but also um, to neighboring countries and, and regions. And so I, I quoted with this reflection by the late Haru Botman on Nyerere, um, because in a sense, it is also um, the question of how his good, the good he might have done will live on in the future and how each of us could be a part of that. So I'll close there, thank you. So it takes the very brave to try to put into metrics <laughs> these ideals of trying to look at well-being, welfare in various dimensions. I'm sure the economists I'm seeing here are salivating in discussing the statistical details on the <laughs> multidimensional measurements of, uh, of welfare. But I have to tell you, uh, Professor, that uh, there was a time in Tanzania we were discussing about uh, poverty reduction progress. And we noted that in spite of massive public investments in education and health and so on, the headcount measure was not changing, was relatively stubborn. And then we were inspired to look a little bit more because how can you say that we haven't made progress when we know there's more attainment in terms of school access, uh, literacy rate, uh, school enrollments, and so on and so forth. And I think we started to think a little bit more in terms of looking at more than just a headcount measure uh, of poverty. And I think that's how many people came across the literature that we have been working on and the work you did with, with uh, Sarkozy and Sarkozy, the measurement of, uh, of GDP. But um, thank you very much for the very good presentations. I should not take too much time because I know you'll have a number of comments and questions later. But if I understand correctly, we are supposed to have a, a coffee breakfast. Yes? yes uh, Professor Nkenda, uh, we're now breaking for uh, tea. And uh, if I can please ask, the discussion is so intriguing, so exciting. Can we make it 20 minutes so we can come back in that time? Or you, you prefer to continue? Yeah. All right. So. So uh, we continue now, and then uh, we break. Uh, so let's we get the whole flow then as it is. So the okay. appetite is very high. Right. Uh, so let me now introduce, uh, have an honor of introducing to you Professor Joseph Stiglitz. Uh, had the profile. He's a Nobel Prize in Economics, 2001, and also one of those very few individuals in the U.S. to have won the John Bates Clark Medal in Economics, the award that is given to distinguished economists under 40 years age. Also, through his lead authorship of the 1995 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, the, the, the work that also won a Nobel Peace Prize uh, in two, 2007. The former chief economist for the World Bank and also chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors to President Clinton. 
a renowned critic of uh, IMF. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Stiglitz, welcome. <laughs> Well, uh, since we're running late, I'll just begin by saying uh, all diplomatic protocols observed and say uh, how much I, I uh, uh, appreciate being here. Um, this is, for me, particularly uh, meaningful. Uh, there's been a number of uh, references to the Arusha Declaration. Uh, I first came to e East Africa and spent uh, uh, a lot of time in the period uh, uh, right after that, in 1969-1971. Uh, in fact, uh, when I uh, gave a talk uh, on Monday uh, at the University of Dar es Salaam, uh, I noted, uh, I observed that uh, it was 49 years since the last time I gave a lecture there. Uh, and I hope that they didn't wait so long to invite me back again. Uh, <laughs> The, um, it was, uh, at, at that period, uh, an extraordinarily uh, exciting time uh, in this region. And it was part of that excitement uh, that really stimulated me, and many of the ideas that led to my Nobel Prize were really formulated while I was here uh, in East Africa. So I feel a, a particular debt to, uh, to, to, to East Africa for that. Um, the subject uh, that I'm going to talk about uh, is, um, oh, do you want to, uh, Okay. So the subject I'm going to talk about is uh, balancing the market, state, and community, which is uh, one of the key principles of the new Stockholm Statement. Uh, what I want to do is, is just, uh, for those of you who haven't uh, had time to read through the Stockholm Statement, begin by uh, just listing, reminding you of, of what those principles are, and spend a minute contrasting uh, the Stockholm Statement with the Washington Consensus. Um, and then I'm going to try to uh, uh, give a, uh, uh, some understandings of how uh, we under, uh, understand the limits of mark uh, and strengths of markets, uh, of state, and the important role of community uh, in the development uh, process. And I'll try to illustrate uh, this with uh, some examples as we, as we go along. So, um, the, the Stockholm Statement, which has been referred to a, a number of times already, uh, represented a rethinking of development strategies. Uh, it, uh, when, I, when I came to uh, the World Bank uh, as chief economist in 1997, uh, the Washington Consensus was uh, very strongly uh, uh, embedded in uh, not only the uh, World Bank, but uh, at the IMF and the standard advice that was being uh, given. And um, again, it was for me a very exciting time because I didn't agree with what most of what uh, uh, the Washington Consensus uh, uh, was engaged in. Uh, part of the reason that I didn't agree with it was I had spent the previous four years um, as uh, President Clinton's chief economic advisor, as the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. And many of the ideas that we were fighting for in the United States were the opposite of the Washington Consensus. So what we were trying to do within the United States in terms of uh, the broad agenda of, uh, uh, of, of uh, education, welfare reform, uh, all those broad issues were the opposite of what uh, the Washington Consensus said. So uh, I got into, uh, you might say, uh, uh, some controversies. Uh, and uh, uh, Kaushik often describes my uh, biggest achievement at the World Bank was reforming the IMF. Uh, so um, uh, 
I'll come back in, in a minute to talk about some of the differences between the, between the two perspectives. But the first is that GDP growth is not an end in itself, and that has just been emphasized. In fact, uh, the commission that I chaired uh, on the measurement of economic performance uh, emphasized that actually GDP was not a good measure of well-being and how well an economy or a society is doing. Uh, the second point is something that's been emphasized over and over again, and I'll try to uh, reiterate it, is development has to be inclusive. The third is something that uh, had been uh, excluded uh, uh, from the uh, uh, discussions uh, before uh, uh, I, I, we had arrived, and that was the importance of the environment, uh, environmental sustainability. Uh, I can't help but uh, just to illustrate uh, the thinking that was going on uh, before was that uh, one of the prior chief economists said uh, at the World Bank said that it was efficient, uh, it was a good thing for uh, the United States to export toxic, toxic waste to Mexico because people die earlier there. And so the uh, cancers which these toxic waste generated uh, often show up, disproportionately show, show up in uh, very old people and since people die younger, uh, it was not relevant for Mexico. So it was a, a, a good trade. Well, you can imagine uh, that that caused a, a little bit uh, of a furor about. Uh, so anyway, uh, environment really is an important uh, part of everybody's life. It's not. A, well, I'm going to talk about climate change a little bit, but uh, it is an important part of the well-being of every individual. Uh, the fourth is what I'm going to focus on today, the need to balance market, state, and community. Uh, the fifth is providing for macro stability. Um, it's a real responsibility of the, of the finance minister, but uh, it means not just balancing budgets or focusing exclusively on inflation. It's trying to get a longer run view of what is long term real stability for uh, society and the economy. Uh, the sixth is attending to the impact of global technology and inequality, the kind of issues that Kaushik raised at the uh, end of his talk about the real fear of what robotization, AI, is going to do to labor markets. And uh, that would require a talk of its own, so I'll just uh, go on. The seventh uh, reflects, uh, uh, you might say, a belated admission of uh, humility by economists, uh, recognizing that the model that economists have used of the rational individual uh, is not a good description of uh, most people's behavior, including if a moment of introspection would realize it doesn't describe our own behavior. And so we talk about uh, uh, the understanding of economics of, of behavior in terms of uh, insights provided by psychology, social psychology, and sociology, social norms and uh, mindsets matter. And the eighth is to try to talk about these issues uh, within a global context. No country can be isolated, uh, is autarkic. Uh, there is interdependence of countries. Um, and uh, unfortunately, international agreements cover only part of these arenas. Uh, and I'll come back uh, a little bit later to talk very briefly about uh, uh, globalization. So as we reflect on these eight principles, we can see that it's a, a very different uh, perspective than was provided by the Washington Consensus, uh, which primarily emphasized markets. Uh, it did not talk adequately about those instances where markets don't work well. It had a narrow view of macro stability, focusing only on uh, inflation, uh, and it had a narrow conception of the goals of development. Uh, it didn't include how the benefits of growth were shared. Uh, it didn't talk about inclusivity, about the environment. But it also didn't talk about uh, the instruments. There are more instruments for monetary policy, as recognized uh, recently in the fight against the, the Great Recession. Um, and uh, there are more instruments for development transformation. 
One I'm going to talk about a little bit later is industrial policies. Uh, industrial policies were looked at askance for a very long period of time. Uh, the view that government should not intervene. Uh, but uh, now there's a, a, a recognition that uh, governments should make use of industrial policies. There was reference a, a little bit earlier uh, to the Nordic model uh, or the Swedish model. Uh, and uh, they were successful uh, because they used a, a lot of instruments uh, including active labor market policies, strong policies of social protection, uh, industrial policies that had been uh, uh, issued from the uh, Washington Consensus. So in the 21st century, uh, we've uh, changed really our view of development. Uh, there are some new challenges, particularly uh, that provided by climate change uh, that uh, it is affecting all countries in different ways uh, uh, and it means that, uh, uh, for instance, any agrarian economy, agricultural economy, will have to adapt. Uh, the principles of inclusive growth have to be rethought. Uh, part of the assumptions, part of the reason that uh, the Washington Consensus didn't pay attention to inequality was that there was a blind faith that if you gave enough money to those at the top, everybody would benefit. There was a sort of an assumption that markets on their own would lead to greater equality. We now know that was not true. There was never any theory, no evidence for it, but it was a ideological belief that served some interest. But what's happened in the United States, for instance, uh, illustrates uh, uh, what happens uh, if you believe in uh, trickle-down economics, uh, which was an ideology that became particularly strong in the United States after uh, Reagan got elected in 1980. Uh, the result of that was that uh, over the last 40-some years, uh, incomes particularly of the average income of the bottom 90% has been almost stagnant. You say, well, GDP went up. The United States is a great success story, isn't it? No, it's not. Uh, because all of the growth went to the top 1%. A number that, if, if you look at American politics and some of the ugliness that you see, uh, there's a simple number that, that really conveys, uh, I think, what happens when you don't pay to, uh, attention to inclusive growth. The median income, median means half above, half below, the median income of a full-time male worker, and a full-time male worker in the United States is a lucky worker, the median income of a full-time male worker in the United States today, adjusted for inflation, is the same as it was 42 years ago. And at the bottom, real wages are the same as they were 60 years ago. So it would be, it's, it's like, you know, Tanzania being at the same level that it was at the time of independence. Nothing had happened. When I give this lecture in China, they find this almost amazing because uh, in this period uh, that I talk about where incomes at the bottom in the United States are unchanged, China moves 740 million people out of poverty, using the narrow version, not the, not the multi-dimensional, uh, uh, multi but even in the multi-dimensional, uh, the numbers that have moved out of poverty were probably even, even greater. So uh, uh, there are uh, further uh, issues that I'll try to talk about uh, in a, at, towards the end. Uh, there is a change in the international global order. Uh, Trump is ushering uh, a new era uh, uh, of protectionism. The United States had led the world in to try to create a world where borders mattered less. For s more than 60 years since World War II, uh, the United States was at the lead, and now uh, Trump has reminded people that borders do matter, 
and that one has to take into account the risk that there would be some rogue country that doesn't obey international uh, rule of law. So again, I'll try to come back to that uh, again. Um, one of the important uh, uh, aspects of the, Washington, of, the, of the Stockholm Statement is to make a clear distinction between means and goals. Uh, for instance, privatization uh, and markets themselves are not ends in themselves. They are means to a broader goals described earlier. And whether they achieve those goals depends on how they're structured. And if they're not structured the right way, they won't achieve those goals. Uh, other variables need to be looked at through this lens. Inflation, budget deficits, current account deficits, they're important, but they have to be seen as part of the intermediate variables related to the ultimate things that we're interested in. So uh, the final thing uh, that I want to emphasize is uh, it's not just that uh, uh, the Washington consensus overly focused on markets. It also ignored uh, the role of the community or broader society. Uh, systems of checks and balances are critical. And uh, the media and civil society play a very important role. Uh, we talk a lot uh, when we learn about uh, uh, government, about the importance of checks and balances between the executive ranks, the legislative ranks, and the judiciary. But actually, what's really important is not only those checks and balances within government, but a broader set of checks and balances within our society. Uh, the media play an extraordinarily important role as part of that system of checks and balances. Uh, it's actually part of, of my own research interest that you might say, what is an economist talking about these issues? But the media are part of the information structure of our society, how we know what is going on. Uh, and that's why also laws about Freedom of Information Act are also important, where Sweden again played a, a very important role, uh, the first Freedom of Information Acts were passed in Sweden more than 200 years ago. Uh, and so access, you know, if you say, what is government? Government is working for us. Uh, it's supposed to be, you know, working on behalf of citizens. If you had an employee and he said, I'm not going to tell you what I'm doing, your, ac your response would be, what? that's really strange. You know, he, he's working for you. you should, he should tell you what he's doing. Well, the government is supposed to be working for ordinary individuals, for all of society. And so they have an obligation to tell the society what they are doing. And the media is the intermediary to try to help us see what is going on. And so they provide sort of a, a, uh, um, a mechanism, an instrument. They provide an important public good in helping us ascertain what is going on in our society. So what I'm going to try to do in this lecture is to focus on some of the new understandings of we, that we have of the balance, the appropriate balance of markets, government, society, uh, based on our new understanding of the determinants of success and development process and general understandings of the market economy. So I'm going to begin uh, and I'm not going to go th through all of what I've put on the slides here, begin by trying to explain both the strength of markets and the limitations. In economics, uh, the, uh, you might say, uh, uh, the god, uh, the, the top of, the, uh, uh, of we, who we worship is Adam Smith. Uh, and he argued that the pursuit of self-interest leagues uh, as if by an invisible hand to well-being of society. The reason for this, uh, it took a long time for economists really to understand what Adam Smith was saying, what were the conditions under which it was true, but it was the solution to the kind of problem that uh, Kaushik talked about. How do you coordinate everybody? You have you know millions of people. 
how do you coordinate what they are doing? How do you provide the information from uh, one side of the, one person to the other person, uh, one firm to the rest of society? And the argument was that prices convey the requisite information to coordinate the actions of society. So uh, uh, that was really the insight that Adam Smith had. But not even Adam Smith believed in the invisible hand. He argued, for instance, for uh, uh, extensive government actions, intervention, you might call it, in providing for education, and he worried about competition. He said, people of the same trade seldom meet together, even for merriment and diversion, but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices. Uh, we sometimes forget about uh, that caution that he had, that there are conflicts, Markets can still be an important, uh, play an important role, but we have to have regulations, for instance, to make sure that we have competition. So one of the important uh, theorems, one of the important results that uh, uh, work that I did with Bruce Green, my colleague at Columbia, Bruce Greenwald, uh, the main result was that, to explain the reason that the invisible hand often seems invisible is that it's not there. Uh, that is to say, whenever there are information imperfections uh, and incomplete risk markets, that is always, and especially in developing countries, markets are not in general uh, efficient. Um, these failures are critical in the process of societal transformation, of development transformation. Uh, Instances where learning is critical and which separates developed from developing countries is not just a gap in resources, but a gap in knowledge. And there are important spillovers from one firm or individual to another. We call those uh, uh, externalities. So the general conclusion of modern research is that unfettered markets on their own won't promote development as well as they should. So. There are uh, pervasive instances where markets don't work very well, and there's an important role for government. Uh, important imperfections of credit markets. And that's true even in advanced countries. The United States has a very important uh, uh, institution called the Small Business Administration, which provides loans to small businesses. And has played a very important role in our growth. So for instance, uh, a whole new industry was started when the government underwrote, guaranteed a loan that created Federal Express. And that was a whole new industry that led to the express mail industry. Uh, there are important, important imperfections of risk markets. Individuals are risk averse. Insecurity is one of the important dimensions of individuals' well-being. And there are important industries that insure people against certain risks, but some of the most important risks they can't insure against. Uh, unemployment, uh, 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 most people, there are no good retirement programs that really guarantee you against the risk of inflation or the volatility of stock markets. So there are a whole set of, of consequences of the imperfections uh, of, uh, of risk markets. One of the importance of the research that, uh, that I did that led to the Nobel Prize was that these kinds of market failures are inevitable. They are the inevitable consequences of imperfections of information. So they're not just accidents that you can repair. Uh, you can't just wish there were perfect information. Information is costly, and so these are, are uh, essentially inherent properties of any market. And one of the major critiques of the Washington Consensus uh, uh, is that they ignore these. And government policies can make markets work better and can help deal with the consequences of these, uh, of these important market imperfections. One example of, of these are uh, related to uh, Macro, what are called ma today macroeconomic externalities uh, and financial market imperfections. So a, a whole uh, strand of recent 
research in macroeconomics has tried to apply some of the ideas that I just articulated at the microeconomic level to the macroeconomic level. Uh, as many of you know, uh, one of the uh, examples where economists uh, uh, were widely criticized uh, was uh, that most economists, I should say most other economists, did not forecast the 2008 economic downturn. And in the UK, uh, the Queen of England uh, uh, asked uh, the economist, uh, why, were you, why were you so bad? Uh, you know, here was the most important economic event in 75 years, 80 years since the Great Depression. Aren't, you know, this is your job uh, it's, uh, to tell us about things like this. How could you make such a big mistake? And uh, the economists, at, particularly at LSE, have been struggling to provide an answer, and I think they still have not given uh, a good answer. Um, uh, my answer is that always they should have paid more attention to me. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that's uh, somewhat immodest. But, but uh, uh, th there were, so this is actually, uh, a question of the sociology of knowledge more than economics, because actually there was the knowledge available and there were economists that did anticipate it. But the m mindset was so narrow that uh, they couldn't see it. Uh, there was one instance, I, uh, a, story, a little story, I was at uh, Davos uh, in 2009, right after the crisis, uh, happened and, and uh, there were several central bank uh, governors and, and uh, sitting on a panel uh, and uh, the theme of these uh, experts was no one could have anticipated the great recession and there in the front row were uh, I was in the front row and a couple of other people, all of whom had given the lecture the year before and the year before, saying that here was a problem. It wasn't just that we predicted it. We predicted exactly what were the underlying forces that led to it. And we said, you know, we said it, but you couldn't hear it. That was the problem. And that was one of the elements of the, of the Stockholm Statement, it's mindset uh, matter. And so you, one of the parks, uh, important lessons of development is to change the mindset about development. Development is possible, and development has to be inclusive and sustainable. Uh, so uh, all of these uh, have important implications for the role of the state. And just as one example that is going on now in why uh, many aspects uh, uh, in Africa, and we had a chance to just talk about it uh, before uh, with the finance minister right before our meeting here, uh, had to do with the IMF. They're finally beginning to recognize that a lot of countries in Africa are once again getting overly indebted. And some of this is government debt, but it's also private debt. And the point is, some of the theories that we've developed have explained why there are incentives for the private market on their own to get excessively indebted, particularly in foreign denominated uh, uh, currencies because they don't fully take into uh, uh, account the consequences of their failures. So there's a need for a strong uh, uh, financial sector uh, regulations. Um, Another important insight is uh, that there have to be government regulations to prevent exploitation. That uh, profits can be enhanced as much by exploiting others as by providing cheaper and better products. So traditionally, the emphasis on the private sector, the great thing is that it does provide, have incentives for innovation, it has incentives for producing better products and producing products that uh, satisfy people's needs. That's the strength of the market. <coughs> but it also has incentives for exploitation. And we saw that in the financial sector in the United States. Predatory lending, uh, abusive credit card practices, uh, monop charging monopoly pricing, uh, a whole set of market manipulation. Uh, the recently Wells Fargo uh, opened up accounts in people's names without even telling them 
that they were opening up the accounts, and then they charged them for the accounts that they had opened up without uh, their knowledge. Uh, so, um, uh, my good friend uh, George Akerlof, who who shared the Nobel Prize with me, and, and Rob Schiller, have written a, a, a book called Fishing for Fools, and uh, you can read that as a a, a, a pun. Fishing is uh, the the uh, uh, internet word of looking around for people that you can take advantage of. So uh, they have a whole book a catalog of examples, important examples, where uh, this has a, uh, occurred. And government, I think, does have uh, an important uh, role in, in preventing this, uh, as well as exp uh, preventing other instances where uh, Firms impose costs in, on others. Most important, of course, are in areas of, uh, uh, of the environment. But also, markets won't produce an adequate supply of things that are really important, uh, public goods, education, health, infrastructure, knowledge, from which everybody benefits. And uh, something that was uh, not so true in the time of Adam Smith, but is very true today, is that these things are much more important than they were 200 years ago. We live in an innovation economy, a knowledge economy. He was talking about pin factories. Uh, that, you know, the economics of a pin factory is very different from the economics of Silicon Valley. So uh, providing these is one of the central functions of government. But the second part, uh, second statement of the Stockholm Statement focused on inclusive growth. And that reflects the fact that markets, even when they are efficient, pay no attention to distribution. And I mentioned before that trickle-down econo trickle economics uh, doesn't uh, work. The objective of development is to enhance the well-being of all citizens. Uh, the final point on the slide uh, is a really important one. And it says that differences among countries, which are huge in terms of the degree of inequality and inequality of opportunity, those large differences of countries that are at the same stage of development, advanced countries, developing countries, what that shows is it's not global forces of globalization and technology that are determining the degree of inequality in our societies, the degrees of inequalities of opportunity. If it were technology, if it were globalization, there would be a high degree of similarity among countries at the similar stage of development. But there are large differences. The Nordic countries have achieved very high levels of equality and very high levels of equality of opportunity. At the other extreme is among the advanced countries of the United States. Not only is it the country with the highest level of inequality, but also among the countries of the advanced countries with the lowest level of equality of opportunity. And what that means is the life prospects of a young American are more determined by the income and education of his parents than in other advanced countries. So I tell my students, there's only one important decision you have to make in your life, one important choice, and that is choosing the right parents. <laughs> and if you mess up on that, and you're an American, uh, the game is over. But in the Nordic countries, even if you make a mistake in choosing the wrong parents, you have a reasonable chance of making it to the top. And that's really important. So that, when we talk about inclusion, inclusion, it's not only equality of outcomes, we also want equalities of opportunities. There's been a, a, a lot of uh, new thinking about the relationship between distribution and uh, economic performance. Uh, it used to be thought that there was a trade-off. One could only, could only get more uh, equality if one sacrificed growth and efficiency. Uh, I wrote a book uh, a few years ago called The Price of Inequality. And the point of that book was to argue that that old view was wrong. That 
our society suffers, our democracy suffers, but even our economy suffers if we have excessive inequality. Inequality at the level that we have, for instance, in the United States. Now, when I said that, when I wrote that, uh, I was viewed a little bit as, you might say, on the left. Um, I didn't view myself that way, but uh, a, a lot of other, but I'm pleased to say that now the IMF has really recognized this. They've done the empirical studies. I did it mostly as a matter of theory of what are the underlying forces, but they backed this up with a large number of uh, empirical studies showing that economies with more equality perform better, have greater stability, economic stability, but of course political stability and social uh, stability. And that's why one of the main messages that the IMF, Christine Lagarde, has carried as she goes around the world is that uh, 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 having a better, uh, a more equal society, a more inclusive society is going to lead to a more uh, better performing economy. Uh, when uh, Str Dominique Strauss-Kahn was asked why, when he, he was the one who changed the uh, perspective of the IMF on this, and he would, uh, was asked, why are you talking about equality? Isn't your job macro stability? Uh, and he, his answer was, uh, yes, that is my job, but greater equality is an important aspect of uh, economic performance and uh, macroeconomic stability. So uh, the important uh, uh, the conclusion of all of this is that uh, um, uh, GDP is, is not a, a good measure uh, of well-being, and since we've already had a lot of discussion of that, uh, I'll skip over that. Uh, and all of this leads to a recognition that uh, government has an important role in regulation, in providing public goods, promoting uh, activities with positive externalities, correcting other market failures, promoting growth, ensuring the growth is inclusive. Um, and the basic role, rule of, uh, function of establishing and enforcing the rules of the game, the basic legal framework, uh, the institutional framework. So these affect not only the efficiency of the economy, but how the fruits are shared. So that one of the big uh, debates now in the United States and in other countries is why is it that the share of labor is going down so significantly? And if you look at the data, uh, 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 <laughs> uh, you'll see that it's gone down uh, even uh, corrected for some, uh, uh, it, the, the decline in the share of labor is even more dramatic and it's because labor protections have been weakened in the United States, antitrust actions to ensure competition have been weakened, uh, the rules of the game have been changed in ways to create uh, a less efficient economy, more ranks, uh, uh, an economy that doesn't function as well uh, uh, as it otherwise could. So, uh, but, um, so th what this all says is that, that uh, government has an important role, an important role uh, uh, in promoting development. If you look at the most successful countries in the world in development, the countries of East Asia, the government played an important role which uh, was called uh, the development uh, state. But uh, um, the, I've emphasized uh, the importance of getting the balance right and when we talk about getting the balance right, uh, we have to start thinking about not only market failure that I've described very, I hope very vividly, but also government failure. And a lot of people criticize uh, me to say, you know, I, you, you uh, uh, talk all the time about market failure, but you don't talk, uh, you don't seem to recognize that there's government failure. And uh, of course, my response is anybody who lives in the United States uh, particularly uh, under President Trump, knows about government failure. Uh, so uh, we know uh, what happens about uh, governments that don't function uh, well. Uh, well, 
uh, there are a couple of important uh, lessons that come out of that in trying to get this balance right. Uh, the first is uh, we have uh, a set of institutions, a rule of law, um, a set of checks and balances that I talked about before that is designed to uh, prevent the abuse of power by any single individual. And these institutions have worked reasonably well. You know, some of us think about uh, uh, as we, uh, what would have happened if we hadn't had these institutions? Uh, you know, things are bad as they are, but it would have been a nightmare. But then when we think about the institutions that have protected us, one of the important institutions is the media. The media that have exposed uh, the lies, you know, an average of five a day, uh, that's impressive uh, uh, that you can keep that up for a whole year uh, at that pace. Uh, in fact, it seems to be increasing. I haven't seen the full charts, uh, but, uh, uh, and uh, uh, that exposes uh, the, uh, and provides a really important, uh, exposes uh, attempts to undermine the rule of law that we have. And uh, it, it, the media has played a really vital role in uh, keeping America uh, within its democratic framework. So, um, and I, I, I mentioned the media as one part of the balance uh, of the community. I said the government, the market, and the community. And that's particularly important in the development process because the objective development is raising the living standards of ordinary individuals. And in a way, who is best to understand what is affecting their lives more than individuals themselves? When I was chief economist at the World Bank, we did a, a, a a uh, study, we interviewed 10,000 poor people and published a book called The Voices of the Poor. And we uh, tried to assess what was it that was uh, making them feel deprived? What do they worry about? And obviously, the most obvious example was lack of income. So that was important. But they mentioned consistently two other things. One of them was insecurity. The fact they didn't know where the next meal was gonna come from, whether somebody was gonna get sick and they wouldn't be able to, to uh, uh, get the medicines for them. All the other things that go into the multidimensional aspect of poverty that we just heard about. So insecurity was really uh, important. And the third was voice. They felt the lack of voice things that they were, they cared about, they didn't feel that they had a voice in the actions uh, that affected their well-being. So in a sense, the process by which development occurs, the engagement of the community is important as a process in itself, giving individuals dignity, the dignity that they have to have their voice heard as part of the development process. Um, so all these are, are, I think, new insights that we now have about uh, the process of successful uh, development. Uh, I was going to uh, go on and give some more detailed examples, but I think we'll have time in our discussion to talk about that. So let me go on to summarize. Is that, do I have a couple more minutes? Uh, I'm, I'm getting a, 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 I wanted to talk a little bit about globalization, but I think I have a discussion of that. So let me just go on, if you could uh, 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 try to summarize some of the marked changes in our understandings in the last 30 years. Uh, then the neoclassical model predominated. Now we understand its limitations, the importance of imperfections of competition, information and in markets, the lack of robustness of the old model the importance of what is called the economics of the second best, with a focus on behavioral economics, uh, endogenous technology and learning. 
then there was a presumption that markets were efficient with the exception of certain well-defined problems like environmental pollution. Now there's a presumption that markets are not efficient or stable, that there are not just environmental externalities, but also information and learning externalities and macroeconomic externalities, <coughs> giving rise to multiple needs for government intervention, not just macro stabilization, but also industrial and trade policies. Then it was thought that one could separate issues of distribution from efficiency. Uh, that was what led one of the uh, uh, presidents of the American Economic Association, who got a Nobel Prize, wasn't that long ago, to say one of the most invidious topics uh, that economists could talk about was inequality. Uh, we had a presidential candidate who said you should only talk about inequality in closed rooms in quiet voices. Uh, who talked about, say, inequality is the politics of envy. It's not. It's about the nature of our society. And uh, now we realize that you can't separate the issues of distribution and efficiency. Uh, then we paid little attention to how markets are structured by the legal system. Economists would simply refer generally to a rule of law with strong property rights rigorously enforced. Now we realize that markets don't exist in a vacuum, that they are structured by our legal frameworks, that, they are, that there are many alternative legal frameworks, and our choices a society makes a great deal of difference for development and distribution. Um, and these are inevitably decisions made by the political system. I, I uh, recently wrote a, a book called Rewriting the Rules of the American Economy, the point of which was to try to say how can we rewrite the rules to create a more equal society. And uh, that's now becoming a, a global movement of various countries trying to think about how they need to rewrite the rules. So then the focus was on limiting the role of the government, getting government out of the way, now we realize the government is essential and a central part of development policy uh, is, imp is improving the performance of the public sector. But there need to be checks and balances in the way that I described a few minutes ago. While the Washington consensus policies and the theories on which they have been based have been widely discredited, their influence still lingers, often masqueraded using different language. The most successful countries built a developmental state and figured out how to correctly balance the market, the state, the community, uh, all, albeit often uh, by trial and error. And I hope uh, the discussion uh, today will help give a, a little bit better uh, sense of how Tanzania can try to achieve a better balance between the market, the state, and the community. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Stiglitz. Deliberately, we didn't want to put time limit on your, on your, your, on your lecture. Uh, we are running short of time, but in, in short, the topic, balancing market states and community, kind of summarize the main topics that we have been discussing today, and it will launch our discussions after, after the break. Just to remind you, just recently, we are taught in classrooms that you know you, you have market failures and you have government failures. Uh, when you have market failures, government interventions exacerbate the failures, and therefore the government should stay out of the market, leave everything to be uh, sorted out by, by the market, and that the rising tide will lift all boats. History has proved that kind of thinking wrong. It took brave minds, great minds like Stiglitz and the others, to try to challenge this and brought, bring us back to the proper Balance. So I think we are going to have a very refreshing discussion, but I understand now we are going to take a health break. Uh, George? Yes. Yeah. Um, we are now going to have a 20-minute uh, tea break. I needed it, so I assume you needed it also. Um, and when we come back, we'll continue now with the plenary discussion, and everybody can contribute for the rest until lunchtime. Uh, those on Twitter, please remember, hashtag inclusive growth or hashtag um,
I just want to make sure you remember that. A <laughs> Stockholm Statement TZ or TZ, depending on where you come from. So please, uh, uh, in 20 minutes time, uh, we'll be coming around ringing a little bell to say welcome back for a nice discussion. And in the afternoon, we have a plen uh, what you call a panel discussion, which will now bring it down to the level what Tanzania can do and hopefully create the uh, basis for the DA statement, as everybody has been stating in the afternoon. So please, don't leave after lunch. Uh, I'll make sure you stay awake in the afternoon. I'll find ways of doing that. So, uh, you're already starting laughing. <laughs> All right, so if you can please have honorable guest, uh, have tea break, uh, guest of honor, if we can start this table, and your excellencies, distinguished guest, welcome to tea, 20 minutes.
Yes, oh, yes, yes. 
Aha. Iya. Iya, oke. Oke. Ah. Yeah. Oh, yes. Mike Testy. Uh huh.
Hello, hey. Apo. Nen pada. Good. Asante uh, ndugu watazamaji tuko hapa na Dr. Christopher Winia ni uh, senior lecturer katika chuo kikuu uh, cha Tanzania Open University of Tanzania tutakwenda kumuuliza ameonaje uh, huu mkutano wa mkutano wa leo pamoja na uh, reflection yake kwa nchi ya Tanzania uh, Dr. Habari njema ndio Dr. Uh, tuambie umeonaje mkutano uh, wa leo mkutano ni mzuri umekuja wakati mwafaka ambapo kuna mipango mikakati ya kuelekea katika uchumi wa eh, kipato cha kati lakini katika kuelekea katika uchumi kuna umuhimu wa kuangalia mtawanyo wa ustawi wa kiuchumi katika jamii ili mtawanyo huo uweze kunufaisha wananchi um, au kaya ambazo ziko katika kiwango mbalimbali mbali cha kipato wakati huu tunapoanza ili katika huo uchumi wakati kweni uchumi ambao kuna kiwa, kipato ambacho kina uiana na haya yako katika tamko hili la Stockholm kwa ni tamko zuri la mwongozo wa namna gani kupima na kupanga uchumi ambao utakuwa utakuwa jumuishi na, na hizi uh, Stockholm statements unazionaje reflection yake kwa Tanzania ni kipi Tanzania kinaweza kikachukua ama kujifunza kwa ajili ya maendeleo uh, pamoja na inclusive growth kwa Tanzania e, kumekuwa na hoja kwa muda mrefu e, kwamba uchumi mpana umekuwa ni e, unaonyesha kwamba kiwango cha uchumi kukua ni kikubwa lakini ule uchumi wa mtu mmoja mmoja Uh, kule ku, uh, ziwe zinatazama uh, ustawi wa kijinsia kwa maana ya makundi uh, kama wanawake ziwe zinaangalia uh, masuala ya mazingira na afya kwa hiyo ni zimekuja kwa wakati mwafaka sisi kama chuo kikuu huria cha Tanzania tuna uh, program ya masters na 